moment. David Pratt, Manager, Researcher, Research and Development, Tensor Research. He holds a BSc Honors and MSc from the University of Sydney in Geology and Geophysics and a PhD in Physics from the University of Newcastle. His early career started with the NSW Geological Survey, and then he worked as a geophysical consultant until 1984 when he co-founded NCOM Technology. He was managing director from 2001 until it was, acqui until it was acquired by Pitney Bowes Software in 2007. In 2010, he started Tensor Research with two colleagues to focus on advanced potential field research. His current focus in the construction of large scale magnetic rock property models using AI, the magnetic tensor and joint inversion. He received the ASEGS Graham Sands Award in 2010 and Larrick Hawkins Award in 2013. David will be addressing AI constrained magnetic formation mapping beneath cover. David, please go ahead. Thank you, Helen. Uh, the opportunity to present to conference uh, uh, after midnight it was a little bit challenging when first offered, but uh, I'm looking forward to uh, presenting a subject which has been close to my heart for quite some time. And the focus is greenfields exploration. And we've been working on a new way of building large scale 3D magnetic models from conventional magnetic surveys and the new generation of full tensor magnetometers that are now becoming available. Talk about the dominance of the magnetic response from the basement unconformity surface and uh, how we recover geological attributes from the, uh, the tensor and the importance of using AI concepts to build a coherent 3D geological model, which forms the basis for constraining the joint inversion. And we also build a rock property database that can be used by geologists as part of it. And I'll illustrate the, the methodology with some case histories from Australia. And I'll start by introducing something that's familiar to most of us, the unconformity concept. And that is that we have magnetic, non-magnetic sediments or just gently changing uh, properties in a lateral sense above an angular unconformity, where the rocks beneath the unconformity surface are steeply dipping and the properties change rapidly uh, beneath the unconformity. The importance is that the unconformity surface produces the dominant magnetic response. And this model is appropriate in general to Paleozoic, Proterozoic and Archean terrains, which have undergone significant folding and structural deformation. Um, using this example from the Mount Isa uh, district in Australia, where the magnetic image shown in grayscale is an excellent proxy for a geological map, for joining the sparse data that we often have for mapping geology. And the principal magnetic response you see there is from the, the unconformity, which may be outcrop or beneath cover as we see up in the northeast corner. And I'm gonna prove it to you with a very simple model concept. I've got a formation, vertical formation, extending down to 10 kilometers and magnetometer is about 200 metres above that unconformity. The actual formation width here is 200 metres. Now, if I throw away 90% of it and bring up the, the bottom of that formation to just one kilometre, run the inversion again for susceptibility, I get a 1.6 RMS difference. They're almost imperceptible, the difference between them. Do the same again to 500 metres, we get to just 3.9% RMS uh, variation. And then to 200 metres, which is equivalent to the, uh, the distance below the sensor to the unconformity, we're still not above 10%. Now that basically demonstrates the dominance of the unconformity surface. And it's fairly easy when you actually look at the underlying maths that it's the angularity that each vertex at that unconformity dominates the response compared with the deeper surface. So essentially, what this tells us is that we're actually mapping with the magnetic method, a thin slice beneath the unconformity. And if we use that as a concept for an automated modeling process, we can simplify a lot of the decisions that are made along the way. And so it's well suited to 
to targeting beneath cover and focusing on that unconformity surface. And moving on to the next one is, all right, how are we going to use that information? Well, we came up with a concept. We've got a set of flight lines. We can put a segment to represent a fairly coarse geological element along each flight line. If we put enough segments together, we can build a realistic looking magnetic map, which reflects the underlying geology. It's coarse, but it's realistic. But what we really want to do is go in the opposite direction. And that's what the rock property and depth mapping program is about. So I've put a schematic together to sort of just to highlight the primary characteristics of what we're trying to achieve. We've got the basement unconformity surface, the top of basement. So we're mapping the properties at that surface on an undulating surface, which may actually become outcrop in some parts of the area. And for each one of these segments, we recover important information. Every one of these segments is associated with one magnetic anomaly on one line. So we end up modeling every anomaly on every line in the survey above a certain threshold. We get the location, the elevation, the depth beneath the surface, the width, strike length, orientation, susceptibility, and importantly, a magnetization vector, which is an indicator for remnants. And the process that we use is based on using the magnetic gradient tensor. Now, there are two ways you can, you can achieve a magnetic gradient tensor from magnetic surveys. You can fly with a high 3D precision survey, uh, which can now be flown by DS Airborne out of Canada. And I noticed that they're a major sponsor for the conference. And uh, Spectrum Air um, is flying for De Beers and Anglo American using the Jesse Star system from Supracon. Both companies are using the Supracon system. And this system will acquire uh, the full tensor magnetic survey along its line. Now, it has a significant amount higher resolution compared with uh, conventional magnetic survey. But there's been an awful lot of total magnetic intensity surveys flown. And what we're interested in doing as well is being able to transform a total magnetic intensity survey to a full tensor survey. And it, it's a fairly straightforward transformation process to do it. And then we resample that information back onto the, the original flight lines. Now, having established that we can actually derive the tensor, we're now going to explore some of the properties of the tensor that make this whole process possible. Uh, the tensor is something that's a little bit difficult to relate to, but I think of it as a, a nice measure of the curvature of the Earth's magnetic field at every measurement point. And we use a process of uh, eigenvector decomposition to obtain the diagonal components, lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, which use a simple formula to derive the normalized source strength mu. Now, David Clark from CSIRO rediscovered and, and further developed this, this technique, and uh, his work is quite well published for people that want to know more about it. But for those that have been working with magnetics for a long time, will be familiar with the analytic signal or the total gradient, as it's uh, also called. And it has many properties in common with the analytic signal. It's just that it has this normalized source strength uh, has a few additional properties. And I put this single slide together to illustrate the primary concepts that we're using to, to extract geological information. So I've got a cross section with a few more vertical sections, each with varying widths. The next track has the normalized source strength uh, response from uh, those particular geological units. And I have one component of the tensor, which you can see is asymmetric doesn't actually image the geology nearly as well as the normalized source strength. So we've got, for a field inclination of minus 60, we have a symmetric response from the normalized source strength. It's a bit like thinking like a reduction to the pole. And that's one of the beauties of analytic signal and normalized source strength is that they effectively remove the effect of the magnetization direction. Now, the peak of the anomaly is effectively the center of magnetization for compact sources, which is particularly convenient when it comes to understanding the mass. A lot of things simplify once we know where the center of magnetization is. So 
it gives you the center for targets like this or for broader targets that will give you the edge. And parameter that comes directly from the tensor is called dimensionality. It's been around for quite a long time, but it's to do with the shape characteristics of the curvature of the, um, the tensor. And it can tell us whether we're looking at a pipe-like, pluton-like, or a linear formation at the peak of the anomaly. Now, we just look at it at the peak to derive that. So we've started to accumulate already significant information. We can also recover interference information, azimuth information. We can get a reasonable estimate of the susceptibility without doing an inversion. But importantly, we get parameters related to remnants, magnetization and inclination and declination for pipe-like and IACG-like uh, shapes. They must be compact to get a reliable estimation of the magnetization direction with little interference. Uh, and we also recover depth from the shape characteristics of the decay of the normalized source strength. There's quite a lot of geological information to recover from the tensor. And that forms a foundation or a starting point for building a, a starting model for inversion. Now, just quickly, it is worth looking at what resultant magnetization is for those that are less familiar. We, we know what the inducing field direction is. But if remanence is present, we don't know what the amplitude of that vector is. We don't know the susceptibility. We can actually recover the resultant sum of the remanence and the inducing field vector. So we get an amplitude and a direction. And the beauty of this vector is that it gives us a departure angle, which we call resultant rotation angle. And that's a direct indicator of the existence of remanence associated with the compact source. There is dip and other magnetization information we can extract, but essentially recovering resultant magnetization is only valid for this style of body and the anomaly associated with it. And that's true for voxel model inversions as well. Now, how do we use all this information? And we call it RPD mapping to simplify it for rock property and depth mapping. It's a three stage. Um, expert system AI process. The first stage is purely based on the line data that we've collected. We use the normalized source strength to pick the anomalies, pick their, their peaks. We then go through a preliminary classification stage using all those attributes that we derive from the tensor to start building a geological picture and then attribute those properties with preliminary depth information and uh, property information. The second stage starts to look across the lines to see how individual segments are linked to their neighbours. That information then feeds into a second stage classifier, an equivalent, and that's a, an AI process. And then we do our first inversion for recovering the magnetization information. That then has produced effectively a starting model for uh, a more comprehensive 3D tensor inversion, where every segment can move backwards and forwards along the flight line. It can change its width and position and its magnetization. And at that stage, we've started to refine the rock property information to a much more compact ver ver version of what we started with back here. It'll go through a la last stage uh, geological check so again, it's an AI process to check the consistency of the model and any changes need to be refined again through an equivalent source inversion. So it's a progressive refinement of the model at all stages controlled by the AI process applied to a reasonable geological model construction process. Now, our goal is to build rock property information, which we can use in targeting. We have a compact magnetic susceptibility derived because it's very focused on the unconformity surface. So we're starting to get properties that are much more realistic uh, in terms of the volume that it's looking at. And we have, we don't measure remnants directly, but we have the indications of remnants. And when you combine this parameter with susceptibility, 
we start to get more diagnostic information on our, our various target styles. And I'd like to introduce the concept of remnants being equivalent to alteration under certain circumstances. If we have, for example, an andesite with a background susceptibility of about 0.01 SI, and there's been a structural event that's allowed fluid to flow along it, and it's destroyed the magnetite content, we will end up with a magnetic reversal. And it's equivalent to a rotation through 180 degrees of the field unless this is also remnantly magnetized, uh, where it could be quite a different rotation angle. And it could look like this, which is an example from the Gawler Craton in South Australia, where we've had magnetite destruction showing up here, and quite a few events like that that are, that are present that indicate fluid, fluid flow. In the right geological circumstance, that fluid flow may be related to mineralization events. Now I'll start with the two case histories, Broken Hill. This example for Broken Hill, it's only about 6,000 kilometres of, of data that we've analysed here. This is the very first stage of the processing before every segment's independent of every other one. There's no inversion taking place. It's just the initial model that we've built from it. And I'm gonna go straight to the final stage, which shows that the models are much thinner which gives us much better estimate of the magnetic susceptibility. And we're also getting more consistency on the magnetic properties and also consistency on the depth information. We can take those models and drop them over other geophysical parameters, such as radiometrics, the geological mapping. But something I've found that's extremely useful is actually being able to use them as a point data set, uh, because we don't really need to have the geological model at this particular point in time. We're more interested in the, the quantitative properties that we have from the magnetics. So here we have susceptibility displayed as a colored symbol, color modulated by the susceptibility, but the symbol size is also dependent on the segment quality. And that's re directly related to the interference and other parameters that we derive during the uh, AI process. And this is our way of displaying our confidence in the results that we're, we're achieving. So we still want to show them that our eye is less drawn to these small features. Now, could do the same with the resultant rotation angle, and this is the direct remnants, uh, existence of remnants indicator, where we've dropped them over the radiometric data. And there's one interesting example here of a linear feature which has also got significant uh, rotation of the magnetization vector. But it also has an elevated uranium trend. It's worthy of following up in the field. Now, putting color on color makes it a little bit hard. So putting the, it over a grayscale image allows to look at the relationships back to the original magnetic data. This is the trend that I just pointed out. It could be dip or it could be remnants. And so I've highlighted this particular feature, set of features, where we've got the formation here that could be dip, or since we could be targeting pyr pyrotite in this area or targeting lead zinc associated with pyrotite, this becomes an attractive target at Broken Hill. This example here shows a, a location along a structure, which could be a, a reversal for a pipe, could be of interest if the area is diamondiferous for for diamond explorers. And here you see that it's picked up the reversal in the, in the magnetic effect, something that gives us uh, another way of looking at reversals in the, in the data. This one here is one that I think is associated with magnetite distraction or an alteration in the, uh, the basement rocks. The second case history is from the Concurry region of Queensland. And we have here just broadly the major mineral deposits and geological mapping at 100,000 scale. A very, <clears throat> a very old survey done by Mount Isa Mines back in 1990 was flown at about 200 metre survey interval. And we picked three areas for an app for working on this particular research project. And I'll show you some of the results. 
I'm going to start with the smaller middle area, which is the first one that, that uh, I tackled here. And what we've done is taken the results, put it on the geological mapping. We've added the um, crustal scale structures, local structures, and the contours are actually what we call pseudo gravity, which is I've found a very useful separation between the high frequency components in MAG and the longer wavelengths that reflect the bulk properties of the magnetic formation. So this is a magnetic granite, which is, uh, you can see the contours, which is outcropping in this region, and it dives under this area. Now I can show the actual gravity data, which is showing an elongation in this direction with the low coming up through here, with a minor saddle on a structure through here, with a number of elevated susceptibility values along this structure. Here we have the potential for a scan where we've got elevated susceptibilities just above the carapace of the granite. The large lettering here, Moronin, Altea, these are all major discoveries in the uh, uh, Concurry region. Uh, they're for reference in the, in the study. And what I've done is taken the same image there, but overlaid mineral occurrence information, which is available in the public domain database. And you'll see here that Sparkle is actually a reasonable size mineral occurrence, which is related to what I believe is probably a scan here. On this structure running through here, we've got two significant uh, mineral occurrences. What I don't know is how much exploration has been done on these at this stage, but adding it as a layer in the data set becomes quite valuable. And we don't have much time to go through some of the other things that we've done with it. But on the bottom area, I've displayed the whole set of solutions for depth over the whole map area as symbols, which are modulated by the confidence, uh, the depth confidence level. And we put a threshold cutoff of about 50% confidence uh, where they almost disappear to a dot. In this region here, we've got a Cambrian uh, half graben superimposed on the, proto the Proterozoic basement rocks. And we can see the depths just along this edge increasing above 100 metres. So red being 100 metres or more, blue being outcrop. On the eastern side, we've got Jurassic cover disappearing in this direction, fairly slow uh, dip in that direction. And the depths are consistently beginning to increase. And just below the Cannington mine, uh, they're starting to increase rapidly in this, in this direction. Uh, the depth mapping is quite consistent throughout the area. We've got cover of anywhere from zero to 50 meters, either transported sediments or residual Jurassic sediments. Just last, um, is we did a weights of evidence study from what could be reasonably deduced from the airborne data using magnetite as a primary vector in relation to structures and nearby uh, intrusions. These are the major discoveries in the area and these are the final weights that came out in the weights of evidence. And the ones detected in this process are shown in red and these are the ones showing on the, the weights here. Now, there are a lot of other targets that we looked at in this area that sit between Cannington, which is an active mine, Eloise is an active mine. And just quickly showing you the use of the, the target weights in combination with susceptibility. So it's the same sheet area where I've got on the left side susceptibility and the weights coming out of the weights of evidence study. Here we've used a histogram stretch for the susceptibility of those particular targets. And on the right, we've used a linear stretch for the weights. And you actually see quite a significant correspondence between the two. Apart from here, where we've got a relatively low susceptibility target generated, but it's on a structure. And after weighting, the, the actual weight increases relative to the original um, analysis. Now, just a quick summary. The use of the tensor 
and artificial intelligence together has given us a new way of utilizing existing magnetic data, but it can be applied to the new, uh, new data sets that are available uh, from uh, DS exploration and from Spectrum Air, uh, DS are using the QMAG-T system. Um, it's focused on the target unconformity. It builds a compact rock property and depth database that we can use. And um, it can be used for alteration and magnetite destruction use, uh, using the remnants indicators. You know, I think I'm running out of time, so I better uh, stop there. Thank you.